offer. But yes, thank you for joining us. So I'm really looking forward to, to our time of just discussing and dialogue about this very important topic about pain management and something called hyperalgesia and maybe even opioid induced uh, hyperalgesia. So this is a workshop I know through the day we have a lot of um, kind of lecture based uh, talks, but we want to make workshops a little more interactive. Of course, Lucas and I have provided slides and content to discuss, but we really welcome questions and dialogue. We would love to hear from all of you in the session in your capacity of work or if and or your lived experience and living experience with dealing with probably the challenges of long-term pain and just to ask us questions so we can talk about you know where research is and and further ideas on on how your work has been informing this field so just want to yeah put that out there that we want to make this really interactive but we did set aside um some objectives and we would like to cover a few critical points that we think would be interesting in the spirit of this conference and talking about translation of research. Um, so first we have you know, a few ideas about the clinical challenges, what we've learned from patients about their long-term pain management and obstacles there. Um, and then we will talk about opioid induced hyperalgesia and how that relates to opioid use disorder and the experience of that in a patient population. Um, and then Lucas will talk to us about some very interesting experimental models and ways to measure hyperalgesia in a clinical and in a lab setting, and then how that can be applied to the clinical syndromes and symptomology. And then we'll move into discussion. If we don't have kind of questions along the way, then we'll set aside the time for discussions at the end. All right, so first off, um, the clinical challenges of long-term pain management. So the prevalence of chronic pain is extremely um, prevalent. And in US and in Canada, I mean, the estimated is about 30 to 40% of the population are dealing with chronic pain on an ongoing basis. Um, of course, it's very hard to, to measure that. It's something that's quite difficult unless someone's presenting with um, the symptoms in the clinic. So that's just an estimation. Um, but at the same time, um, we are now in an opioid overdose crisis in North America. And um, I mean, in Europe, they have really dealt with this a little bit better, I think, than in North America. But here we've had this um, crisis that has been ongoing. And there's been you know, a lot of criticism that it's because of the overprescription of pain medication, um, unaddressed pain, um, and then a sudden also changes in prescribing patterns. Um, and in policy that has really affected uh, people's access to effective pain treatments, potentially leading to um, illicit use of opioids. But it's hard not to recognize that um, chronic pain really is a disease in its own right, and it really needs um, effective treatment. So how do we bridge that? Um, now that there's a, like a reluctance among um, prescribers to provide opioids to individuals, especially for those who have a history of chemical dependency um, and with opioid use disorder. Um, do we leave, you know, patients and individuals struggling then with long-term pain and having it, you know, mismanaged? So how do we find the right balance? How do we provide optimal treatment for individuals and make sure that we're not under-treating pain? Because for a long time, there's been a criticism that we're over-treating pain. Um, and maybe it's that we need better measurements of pain to recognize, you know, the levels of distress people really are in. Maybe some more objective measures, you know, would that help with pairing it with the more sufficient treatment? Those are some questions, I think, clinically now that we're, we're trying to grapple with. <clears throat> um, now, there's another, um, like, two elements, I think, of long-term pain treatment and how that leads to um, the experience in patients. So one is analgesic tolerance, and another is opioid-induced hyperalgesia. And these two are actually quite distinct pharmacological phenomenon. Um, they may present similarly in that people seem to require higher and higher doses of opioids to manage their pain, but they're actually working quite differently within the system. So with tolerance, um, usually what happens is there's a progressive decrease of analgesia that's produced by giving the same dose of opiates. 
uh, with chronic administration, there is the need to gradually increase the opiate dose in order to maintain that same initial analgesic effect. Now, on the contrary, with opioid-induced hyperalgesia, that usually refers to the development of a hypersensitivity to painful stimuli, and that is also observed after chronic opioid administration. And so even though the treatment is supposed to relieve patients of their pain, what happens is in an opposite way, it actually might generate more exasperate, uh, exacerbated pain sensation. So that's something that's quite difficult to deal with uh, when a patient presents with those symptoms. So in the clinic, these two phenomena, they're actually conflicting because the development of analgesic tolerance will actually lead to increased opiate usage. And then what in turn might happen is then the advancement uh, and enhancement of opioid-induced uh, hyperalgesia. So whereas escalating the dose of opioids might provide pain relief in tolerant individuals, it can actually worsen the pain for those with hyperalgesia. So it's trying to determine what is the situation that a person is experiencing and then trying to find kind of the best course of action to support them. Now to complicate things a little further, uh, opioid, um, opioid use disorder often is treated with opiate maintenance therapy. But unfortunately, there then presents um, indications of opioid-induced hyperalgesia and therefore patients can have no you know, more improvement of the pain that they're experiencing, but they and then they start experiencing you know, heightened pain sensitivity, but they would still need the opioid maintenance uh, therapy for their opiate use disorder. So it's, you know, with patients in that case, what would be the best course of action is quite difficult to, to really help them uh, manage this. So I wanna bring up one um, study that was done here in Vancouver. And this was a study to assess long-term opioid medication effectiveness. And why I wanna share about this study, the short um, form, we call it the Salome study, which was done a few years ago, was when this study was run, um, there were very little options for heroin assisted treatment here in Vancouver. So even though it was um, tested and shown to be quite effective in a lot of European countries, um, it wasn't really an option. And um, so this study was done to really demonstrate that injectable diacetamorphine and also hydromorphone can both be effective uh, treatments for those who struggle to have their opiate use disorder effectively addressed with what was available, which was usually methadone or buprenorphine um, approaches. Um, and what, I mean, the main point of this study really was to demonstrate the effectiveness of those two injectables. But in addition to that, there were um, additional surveys to assess uh, the participants or the patient's experience of pain. So that's the aspect of the study I wanna share about is that with this quite high dose of um, the heroin assisted treatment, do participants still feel pain and is that addressed? And <clears throat> why that's important is because although in Salome, um, this sample here was about 200 participants, it still is not something that's broadly and widely used. So if heroin assisted treatment for these individuals still cannot address their chronic pain, that leads us to you know, answer the questions of why in, for example, methadone maintenance therapy, um, the retention rate is so low. Could it possibly because, you know, people are not having their pain effectively addressed in, in those situations? So what we found from the um, study here was that people were receiving two daily injectable doses of either diacetamorphine or hydromorphone. Um, but unfortunately, at baseline, the 21% of participants who did report that they experienced moderate to severe pain or discomfort, which prevented most of their regular daily activities, um, that remained unchanged at six months. So despite receiving two daily injectable doses of these two really high potent opioids, um, they still would deal with um, pain that they would rate as moderate to severe. Um, so that's quite, quite concerning. And then 30% um, still say that they required additional prescription narcotics for pain relief, and that pain still constantly disrupted their normal activities. Uh, and then in the table below is from just another scale that was incorporated into the study. 
and it was asking people to rate their pain and discomfort of that day in which this um, survey was taken. So <clears throat> at baseline, we have out of the 200 people, 85 you know, saying that they had no pain, but 83 of them expressed that they had moderate pain and the 32 with extreme pain. Now, as you move along the timeline of the study at three months and then out to six months, the number of people who were experiencing moderate and extreme pain were still significantly high. So it wasn't being managed well by the diacetamorphine or the hydromorphone. So that's um, curious. Um, and also something that I would say in, in the study wasn't really a focus. So, you know, people weren't really um, asked further about this sensation of pain and how they were treating it. Would it be then leading to additional illicit opiate use? I mean, possibly. Um, and that potentially could lead to, for example, I was saying before with other treatments that are, for example, less um, potent, why the treatment dropout rate could be very high for individuals. Excuse me? Um, yes. Sorry for interrupting, um, but I, no. I have a question already. Um, do, do you know whether the Salome researchers checked for a dose relationship? Was because since there was no change in, in moderate, no, and severe pain, um, maybe, there, maybe there was a relationship with the hydromorphone and diacetylmorphine dose? Yeah, well, the objectives of the study was um, to look at how it effectively managed illicit heroin use in individuals. So the Salome study was effective uh, and shown to be, you know, both treatments were effective in that it reduced um, the illicit heroin use in individuals. So that was their major outcome, the primary outcome they were looking at. So these pain measurements really wasn't affecting how they monitor the daily dosing for individuals, but that would be another key aspect, for example, in ongoing support for patients is to actually ask them what the experience of pain was and whether that is, you know, could be helped by either increasing the dose or if it was opioid-induced hyperalgesia, maybe it's a gradual decrease mm -hmm. to assist with that. Um, so still being um, managing withdrawal symptoms, so keeping them on maintenance, but then gradually decreasing it so that if it was hyperalgesia, that could be slowly kind of managed. But that's something that was not, you know, like a key piece of the study mm -hmm. yeah, That's of something that we looked at in hindsight yeah yeah thanks yes thank you um so that, that leads me to just presenting a few questions on how um, these treatment related issues could lead to research translation um, the first is can we um, accurately determine the level of pain sensitivity or even measure the state of opioid induced hyperalgesia in patients like is that something we could model in a clinic um, can the mechanisms driving uh, opioid-induced hyperalgesia be clinically modeled and how so? And then if, if that's possible, then maybe this understanding, I mean, could it help better inform treatment support for long-term pain in patients or potentially uh, identify them earlier and prevent the development of opioid-induced hyperalgesia? These are kind of open questions that taken from kind of the clinical work and um, kind of experiences we've heard from patients. So then that leads me to pass this on to Lucas, who will then um, present his models and how perhaps we could model these things and measure them. Okay, can you see my slides, Fiona? And mm -hmm. everyone else, great, okay. Um, so something a little different, I guess. Um, oh yeah, so first, uh, thanks Fiona for inviting me to contribute to your workshop and Max for um, invigilating and doing the introductions. So I can advance slides, beautiful. All right, so the first thing I wanna do is um, acknowledge the Kramer Lab and all the trainees that I get to work with every day. Um, without them, none of these studies would have happened or would be continuing to happen. Then I also need to acknowledge the Craig H. Nielsen Foundation. Uh, they generously fund me, as well as two of the projects that I'll hopefully touch on today. So starting from a more basic idea, I always like to make sure everyone's on the exact same page before I dive into some uh, of my studies. So when I'm talking about hyperalgesia, kind of the definitions we're using and I like to use. So if we look here on this graph, I've got seamless intensity for in the x-axis and pain intensity on the y. 
So looking at that blue line, we could call that, say, some kind of normal pain response. So if we imagine, say, someone pushing really hard on your shoulder, and as they push more and more, at some point, it's going to start to hurt, and the pain is going to get worse and worse until you get to some kind of tolerance level or hopefully not some injury happens. So when talking about hyperalgesia and thinking about, say, an injured state, say a good example I like to use is someone rolls their ankle. So when that ankle gets rolled, um, lots of inflammation happens, and then that joint now gets quite tender to the touch. And that tenderness of to the touch um, and that, that pain from just a light touch can be termed allodynia. So then that's pain from a uh, stimuli that used to be unpainful and that was painful. And then the hyperalgesia component is now increased pain from previously painful stimuli. So it's kind of represented by this nice shift of the curve um, to the left-hand side shown here in red. So I'm gonna to touch on a couple of models we use in our lab about how really do we model hyperalgesia and really how can we measure it beyond um, asking people how it feels. Uh, what we're most interested in is understanding kind of adaptations in the spinal thalamic tract and more objective measures using neuroimaging techniques. And then the next thing I'm gonna talk about briefly is can we mitigate the development of hyperalgesia? So we've been working on a knockout model using capsaicin um, that's been around for a while, but we've been tweaking away at it. And I'm gonna end with showing a very brief clinical case study um, where we've applied this knockout model to someone who's living with um, neuropathic pain. So first I'm gonna talk about a, some of the simple ways we model and measure hyperalgesia. So when inducing a state of hyperalgesia or injury, two things that we can look at and measure are primary hyperalgesia and secondary. So primary refers to the region where a specific injury happens. So you can imagine here in this little figure, um, if you were to burn that region of the skin, where that skin was burned is the primary region. Secondary hyperalgesia is mechanical sensitivity, and it is um, in the area surrounding that primary site. And that hyperalgesia involves um, uh, mechanisms in the dorsal horn and the spinal cord known as sensitization. So the way we tend to model um, hyperalgies in our lab is using capsaicin. So capsaicin binds to trp one receptors in your peripheral nociceptive afferents. So those peripheral receptors and neurons that tell you about pain. So a couple of interesting things happen with capsaicin. The first is that when you apply it, obviously it activates those receptors and causes a burning like sensation that hurts. But if you apply it for more long-term, you actually defunctionalize those receptors and knock them out a little bit. So first I'm gonna talk about a study where we show how we can best measure um, that initial induction of the primary hyperalgesia. So here we use a technique called contact heat evoke potentials. Now what contact heat evoke potentials are is we apply contact heat in the periphery um, using a thermo that very rapidly increases and decreases in temperature. So you can see there uh, the stimulation protocols in that uh, second panel from the right in the bottom figure. Um, and how we record our outcomes of quantitative potential is using electroencephalography or EEG. So here we're measuring uh, responses at the uh, CZ or centroid or um, vertex position, rather, excuse me, with respect to mastoids. So we're looking at how the brain is responding to these heat stimuli. And in this study, we were most interested in understanding, well, what is our optimal parameters for really capturing what we expect to be this change in primary hyperalgesia after we apply capsaicin? So we compared a uh, topical application of capsaicin, which we know induces a burning like pain, to a control day. And what we observed is looking at uh, these evoked potentials. So if you can see my mouse on the screen, hopefully you can. If not, I'll walk through it anyway. Looking at that recording site figure in the middle, there's a little depiction of an outcome at the bottom that shows these grand average waveforms. So you have an N2 component and a P2 component. So things we can look at in terms of the outcomes are the amplitude, so how big that N2 and P2 is, and the latency, so the timing of when they happen. So did the curve happen earlier or later with respect to those two peaks? So what we showed in this study, looking at now this figure over on the far right-hand side, looking at the three different stimulation protocols, comparing uh, capsaicin in the orangish yellowy color and control in gray is that we showed a reduction in N2 latency of these evoked potentials when we applied stimulus intensities at a lower starting temperature compared to the high. So this was a, so this tells us that we can use uh, quantitative potentials in a certain way to help capture a more uh, centralized brain response to that peripheral sensitization model when we apply capsaicin in the periphery. So while that is good um, and helpful, uh, a lot of feedback we often get from people is that, well, it's great that I'm good at measuring how I make things worse. What about making things better? So as I alluded to before, something else unique that happens with capsaicin is if you apply it for a long period of time at a low dose, or if you apply at a very high concentration in one dose, 
you actually cause localized defocalization of those um, peripheral receptors. And what this looks like in a biopsy is essentially your peripheral nociceptive afferents uh, almost retract away from the skin and they look like they die off. So using a pretty complicated model, a math student in our lab, Hannah Gooding, seen here enjoying a day on the slopes, set up this study in the middle of COVID. So it's quite complicated for her to get people in and out. But in essence, what she did is she had people apply low concentration topical capsaicin to a small region on their forearm, depicted here in these figures um, using the red uh, little squares. So they applied a few times a day for 20 days to knock out um, the trp one receptors and pain sensations in that region. And then they came back in on day um, 21 days after to look at a whole bunch of outcomes. The first of which being where contact heat evoked potentials seen here in A and cold evoked potentials B. So contact heat, as I alluded to in the last study, looks at uh, how our brain is responding to those hot painful stimuli, whereas cold evoke is looking at a different kind of receptor, which is trip e, or trip MA receptors, and it has to do with cold or kind of menthol receptors. So after 21 days comparing a control region to a capsaicin region, um, the CHEPS response across their 12 participants was more or less abolished. So these people also didn't really feel um, any sensation to the heat thermode. And in response to that, we see no response in their brain. Whereas the cold of a potential here shown in B were fairly consistent between control and capsaicin sites. So this defunctionalization seems to be quite specific to your trip B1 receptors or your burning pain receptors. The other way we knew that this worked was over that 21 days, individuals recorded their daily pain rating to this capsaicin cream they were applying. And you can see here this, uh, that shaded line in the middle is kind of the grand overall average of all the participants from day zero to day 20 of application and pain rating on the y-axis. So over time, people felt less and less sensation to um, that capsaicin application. So it was slowly and steadily knocking out their pain sensation. Now, where this gets more interesting in terms of we can knock out that sensation, well, what about um, secondary hyperalgesia? So if you remembered early on, I said there's that primary region associated with the initial injury and secondary hyperalgesia is the surrounding region. So following assessing uh, CHEPS and SEPS, she uh, introduced people to a fairly painful heat ramping protocol where they were exposed to over 60 stimulations of 48 degrees heat that was on for about six seconds and off for 10. Um, and the purpose here is to induce a very low grade burn. And she did it in between the control and capsaicin regions. So what she's doing in essence here as shown in the bottom figure is she was inducing a primary hyperalgesis site right in between her capsaicin knockout and control regions. And then she assessed secondary hyperalgesia in those two regions. So in these two figures here, we're looking at mechanical pain sensitivity. So the stimulus on the x-axis um, is pinprick intensity. So as these pinpricks get heavier and heavier in weight, they get sharper and sharper and hurt more. And we have normalized pain ratings on the y-axis. So in the control regions where we didn't apply any capsaicin um, as part of this model, people tended to, following this burn injury, have an increased mechanical pain sensitivity, specifically at some of those middle stimulus intensities. So what that tells us is that unsurprisingly, when you cause a little burn model, you still have secondary hyperalgesia or this um, secondary pain response happening in regions adjacent. However, in the capsaicin treated region, we saw no change in mechanical pain sensitivity, meaning that perhaps by knocking out those trp one receptors, we are not only causing them to feel an individual to feel less pain in that specific region, but we're also influencing some of the central pain mechanisms that give rise to the development of secondary hyperalgesia as well. So taking these lessons in a clinical application and where all these studies are slowly going is uh, trying to understand and improve some therapeutic options for individuals with neuropathic pain. So there's a case study currently ongoing in our lab that we're almost finished wrapping up where we have a 62 year old male with a C6, C7 level incomplete spinal cord injury. He's currently one point years post injury. He's non ambulatory and his pain is fairly well managed pharmacologically except that he has really intense burning pain on the back of his left hand specifically. Um, so this pain often will wake him up at night and it's kind of become the, the main focus of his attention in terms of trying to improve his management. So knowing that our capsaicin model and capsaicin in general is targeting those burning like receptors, our thought was maybe we could knock out those burning receptors in this individual. So he applied capsaicin to the back of his left hand three times a day for 21 days. And we, and we assess his mechanical pain sensitivity in that primary region before and after, as well as on his other hand to serve as a control. 
So here I'm showing you pin prick stimuli uh, from eight all the way up to 512 on the x-axis and his pain ratings to each of those stimuli repeated five times each on the y-axis. So the control pre and post um, is in the two grays and then capsation uh, pre is in yellow and capsation post in red. So on his control hand or his hand where he doesn't really experience any burning pain, he showed fairly really low um, pain sensitivity in both days on the region where he's experiencing burning neuropathic pain. Um, before we applied capsaicin in the yellow line there, his pain was quite high at higher pinprick levels. And then after knocking out the trapezoid receptors in that region with this capsaicin application, it looks to us that we've reduced his mechanical pain uh, sensitivity in that region. And he's also reported to be having generally um, not getting woken up at night as much by his pain and the sensation is somewhat improved. So overall, um, some of the things we do in our lab is we use top of capsation and sensory testing to help model and measure hyperalgesia. And currently we can use a knockout model to potentially mitigate some of its development as well as have some clinical applications for use. And that's all I have for today. I'm gonna to go ahead and stop sharing my screen.